Well, I picked the right Mets game to go to this weekend as they pick up a victory on Sunday. We'll talk about that and some aggressive promotions in the farm system on today's edition. Locked on Mets. You are locked on Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Well, they did it. The Mets did not get swept by the Marlins. It's a great achievement for this club, and I was there to see it. In person, I caught the game on Sunday, had a very stressful uh, original drive down. First, I couldn't find my sunglasses. Uh, I have prescription sunglasses, so I need them to drive. I'm looking all over the house for them. I think I'm going to be late. I, I get down to the ballpark. Um, I'm, I don't have any tickets. I was using game time last minute. Tickets want to get as good of a deal as possible. That was super easy. Uh, I was stopped at a long light on the drive. I was like, all right, this is my chance. And I'm telling you, 45 seconds. I had my my seats purchased through Apple Pay, and I was I was all set. But I get to the ballpark, I'm thinking, man, I'm gonna miss the first inning. Let's put Howie Rose uh, in the earbuds and listen to the ball game. And first, it for well, I thought it was gonna be the beginning of the game, first inning, and realized it was a 140 start, not a 110 start. So I don't know if it's ever happened to any of you guys, but man, I was thrilled. I was like, all right, I can get in the ballpark in time. Um, by the time I actually got in there. Went to the bathroom, got myself a little drink. I got to give Marlins Park a shout out. Their food is terrible, but they now this year, I think it's the first time I've seen this, they're serving the, the adult cocktails in a nice little aluminum tin cup. Um, I don't know if I made that sound as appetizing as it really was or as refreshing as it was. But man, those, those drinks in those cups to keep them nice and cool. Nice addition from Marlins Park. Again, food was horrible, but... I ended up sitting down second batter of the game. So I missed Francisco Lindor getting hit by a pitch. I want to give a shout out to my boy, Clay Snowden, who might be listening to this. Uh, he is a writer for us at Just Baseball, and he is an avid listener to all of the Locked On podcasts. So I know he tunes into me every once in a while, but he shot me a text. I know the hit by a pitch got you worried. I'm like, actually, I missed that. That was the only play of the game I did miss. Uh, after that, from, or excuse me, Pete Alonzo flew out. Brandon Nimmo walk, DJ Stewart loads the bases. So I'm feeling good. I, I was excited for this game because Sixto Sanchez was on the mound for the Marlins, and I thought the Mets would tee off, and they delivered on that in the first inning. Tyrone Taylor cashes in two with a double. Brett Beatty then drew a walk, and then Jeff McNeil comes up with the bases loaded and one out. And I don't know about you guys, but from my seat, I'm watching Jeff, and I'm like, here comes the inning, inning double play. The Mets only get two runs when they should have got way more. I just saw it happening, and it was a remarkable thing when you are thrilled when a player pops out because at least it's just one out instead of two. And Harrison Bader immediately cashes in on the opportunity, drives in two more with a base hit. So the Mets are up 4 nothing before Sean Maniah takes the mound, and I'm feeling pretty good. I got to the game on time, got my cocktail, I'm, I'm feeling fresh. I'm like, all right, the Mets are going to win this one. What proceeded was an agonizing watch for me. Uh, you know, Manaya, I wasn't overly impressed. Um, he really only got burned in the second inning when he gave up a two run homer to Dane Myers, um, on a hanging slider. But other than that, it, he was, he was good, but just not great. And a lot of pitch counts going deep. And all of a sudden you look up in the fifth inning, he's past 90 pitches. And sure enough, that's all they got out of him. Last five hits, walked one, struck out four, just the two run runs on the homer. So it wasn't a bad start. His ERA in the season is 3.11. You can't really criticize Manaya, but you look at the career high walk per nine over four, 4.08. And I, I just, especially in a six man rotation, if he's five and dive in a six man rotation, it can hurt you. And it could hurt what will be eventually a bullpen that's going to pitch one man down. So we'll see. I don't want to criticize him too much, but I really thought the Mets needed to get six out of him against that Marlins lineup. And they just only got five. And I'll also say, as bad as Sixto Sanchez looked, because I'll tell you what, if you want a, a telltale sign of a guy that doesn't have great stuff, just watch how many f you know foul balls are being hit in the ballpark. Because when you have a guy that has really good stuff, 
there's a lot of swing and miss with Sixto Sanchez. I mean, there was one at bat where I think DJ Stewart must have fouled like four or five pitches off that, you know, he was just getting under and they were going out into the stands. Nimmo had an at bat like that too. So uh, the guy does not have good stuff and the Mets just couldn't do anything else after that first inning. Uh, Pete Alonso nearly missed a hole or narrowly, I should say, missed a home run in the second. And that ball that he hit, it was a double basically off the wall. It would have been out in 22 or 30 ballparks, but Marlins Park plays big, so that one didn't get out. The Mets caught one back in that regard, though, as Josh Bell could have greeted or could have uh, sent Manaya to an exit with the home run, the final out that he got, but it held up in center field. It was an absolute bomb, um, but Bader was able to make the catch, and you know Manaya was able to avoid any further damage. So, you fast forward throughout this game, right? Sean Reed Foley, scoreless sixth. He looked great. I, I think the Mets are going to really need him with the Edwin Diaz situation, which we'll talk about more in the next segment. Jake Diekman comes on for the seventh. He gives up a home run. So now I'm sitting here in my seat like, okay, it's a one-run lead now, 4-3. You got Diekman, and who else is going to pitch behind him? No Edwin Diaz likely, and you don't want to see Edwin Diaz right now. So it's probably Garrett. And Adivino, I was nervous. And then Diekman hits Jazz Chisholm with a pitch. So you have a base dealer on first. <laughs> here it is. Here it is. I, I came down here to the ballpark, and I'm going to leave pissed off. Luckily, Jazz Chisholm leaves early on a stolen base. Easy pickoff for the Mets. That really was a huge out. And then Diekman gets through the rest of that inning. Um, then you come around to uh, Reed Garrett, eighth inning appearance, which I, I love to see. Stress free, he struck out the side. Uh, but again, one run lead. Luckily, top of the ninth inning, for the first time since the top of the first, I was able to breathe. Um, I guess maybe that home run came in what the second inning, the, the one that Manai gave up. So uh, for the first time since the bottom of the second, I guess you could say, first time I was able to breathe. And that's because Brandon Nimmo came through with the two-run homer. Crushed that ball, would have been a homer in all 30 ballparks, 395 feet to right center field. That gave the Mets some breathing room. Then Stolly Marte gets hit by a pitch. Tyrone Taylor singles. Brett Beatty drives in Marte. So now you're sitting with a four-run lead. I felt pretty good at that point, especially when Garrett went back out to the mound. And he got the job done. So when it comes to the question about who's going to close games right now, Reed Garrett. First up, it's closer by committee. So Adam Adovino, probably the guy if the Mets have a save opportunity on Monday. I want to talk about the continued fallout from that situation from Edwin's, not even a blown save, blown game. Wasn't even a save opportunity on Saturday. What's the latest on him? How are the Mets going to manage that moving forward? And what are they going to have ahead in this upcoming series against the Guardians? We'll get to all of that in just a minute. First, though, a word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Policy Genius. You never know what could happen in life. That is why it's always best to be prepared. Make sure that your family is always taken care of. This is why everyone should have life insurance, but sometimes finding the right policy is not easy and can be really time consuming and even overwhelming. This is where Policy Genius comes in. Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace that will save you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same-day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius will help you compare quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price, and their team of licensed experts is on hand to help talk you through it. Check life insurance off your to-do list in no time with Policy Genius at policygenius.com slash lock.mlb or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash locked on MLB. Today's episode is also brought to you by our sponsor, Yahoo Finance. Wouldn't it be great to see all of your investment and retirement accounts all in one place? With Yahoo Finance, you can consolidate your views from multiple accounts into one hub and access expert analysis you need to tend to your entire portfolio with confidence. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. I'm new to the investing game, 
So I need all the help I can get as I try to set up my portfolio. It still sounds weird for me to say a portfolio, to be completely honest with you. But with Yahoo Finance, when I plug myself in there and I look at everything that they have to offer, I feel like a seasoned investor. And they give you all the extra guidance you need with the tools and data all in one place. They're the number one financial destination, producing a holistic view at all the different financial news cycles, including breaking news, original editorial perspectives, uh, and analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. With a community of over 90 million users each month, their real strength is helping you on your way to financial success. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. If you're an everyday listener to the show, make sure you become a Locked On Mets insider. This is our texting service where I get to send you updates anytime something breaks on the Mets, where you can ask me questions anytime. It's also where you get the lineup graphics sent to your phone each day so you know who's in the starting nine. You can also be part of our Locked On Mets signed photo giveaway. So if you want to be a Locked On Mets insider, head over to Subtext or find the link in the episode description. So you go to subtext.com slash Locked On Mets or find the link in the episode description. Now, the Mets announced on Sunday that Edwin Diaz is no longer the closer for the time being. The Mets are going to a closer by committee. We saw today Reed Garrett getting the first opportunity. Adam Adovino was warming up. He's clearly another guy that can get some looks. I think Jorge Lopez would be another candidate as he has already gotten some save chances this year. I also wouldn't even be surprised if we see Sean Reed Foley, not necessarily in the ninth, but definitely pitching in some leverage right now. He's thrown the ball very well for the Mets up to this point. Um, Jake Diekman, we saw him pitch and leverage today. Not the best. Uh, and he is your one lefty right now. So this bullpen definitely feels a little bit more fragile with Edwin Diaz. And I talked about Diaz a, a ton on yesterday's show. I, I didn't think they were actually going to send him down or do anything too crazy. I threw it out there as just, how do you get this guy's head on straight? And we'll see. I, I think this was the first step. You remove the closer roll. You take some pressure off. And I'm sure he gets in there at some point um, in this series against the Guardians, maybe even in a situation where there's some leverage attached to it. It's not going to be the ninth inning, but he's still an arm in this bullpen that they have to go to at some point. So if you're sitting there and let's just say it's a zero zero game and uh, McGill's done at their five, you might have to go to Edwin Diaz in that ball game. Okay. And, and you see what happens, but uh, I think there was, a couple of positive developments that make me think that this is going to be short-lived. So for one, Edwin Diaz had a smile on his face, according to all reports today, said he felt good, even felt great, threw a bullpen, getting everything sort of in line so that he can feel right again. I think that there was probably a lot that went into the outing on Saturday. And I, I know I touched on it on yesterday's show, but I want to reiterate it, especially for those of you who might not have caught that show. I think there might've been some extra emotion stepping on that mound at Marlins park or Lone Depot park, considering what happened in the world baseball classic in that ballpark. And then now you, you take that and you're not feeling like yourself. You've blown these games to the Phillies. You're just not feeling like that dude who was the best pitcher or the best reliever in baseball in 2022. And was in that world baseball classic with that same swagger. Maybe it brought it all back. And then your worst nightmare is you go into a situation where you have a four-run lead and you blow it and you give up a three-run homer and it's just crushing. And not that I I felt bad for being critical because that that's what we do here. If someone's performing bad, you got to speak on it. But to hear the Edwin Diaz who met with the media after the game and answered all the tough questions, you know, was as professional as you can be. That as soon as the questions stopped, he broke down in tears. And that's devastating, okay? Because for one, Edwin Diaz has become a, a real fan favorite. He's just a good guy. You can just tell. And you don't want to see anyone hurting like that. And, and as much as there was hundreds, if not thousands of Mets fans that were cursing at Edwin Diaz, no one wants to, to see that guy have to live through this right now. You know, he he's going through it. He cares. and you know, he has worked tirelessly at his craft to get himself back. 
And even though the velocity hasn't returned and he's been off, I don't think he's that far away from clicking into gear. So to see his teammates rally around him, Lindor and Sean Reeve Foley were mentioned as guys that really consult him in that moment. And then they go out and they win a game for him on Sunday to at least salvage something from that series in Miami. I think Edwin Diaz might be able to turn things around in, in short order. I think he might pitch um, in, in this series in Cleveland and look lights out and, and maybe erase a lot of doubt before he has to face the home crowd again. I don't know what you do with Narco whenever they get back to City Field. If he comes in the sixth inning, do you still play it? Who knows? Uh, but I, I feel like Edwin Diaz is going to make us all look foolish for doubting him, but he's got to go out and prove it. So I, I like the current plan. They have guys that can save games, get them out of that top, top leverage situation. And maybe as he continues going here, who knows, maybe you, you, you have him be opener to Hauser on Tuesday, but you get him some opportunities here. And I think he's going to turn things around for the Mets. Now, one thing that's hurting the Mets right now is the flu is killing them. Uh, it's been weeks on end. It's been over two weeks since the Lindor flu game. And that was something that they said had started out, out on the West Coast in L.A. So really this whole stretch where the Mets have been really bad, a flu has been present throughout their clubhouse. It's been taking guys out on Sunday. It was J.D. Martinez and Starling Marte that were not in the starting lineup. Marte did get in the game. Martinez did not, even though they're – was some opportunities where you could have pinch hit him if you wanted to. So not that we're going to say, oh, it's the flu. That's why the Mets have been bad. It is something to at least mention and acknowledge that 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 could be part of what has made them maybe look a tick or two worse than they actually are during this bad stretch. Now getting to the series against the Guardians. The Guardians are 30 and 17 this year. It's a good baseball team. They're one of four teams in Major League Baseball that have reached the 30 win mark. It's them, the Phillies, the Dodgers, and the Yankees. Uh, they won six out of their last seven games. It's not going to be an easy series. And they just swept over the weekend their division rival, the Minnesota Twins. Jose Ramirez has been red hot lately, as has Andres Jimenez. Our old friend is 12 for his last 24. Not great numbers on the season, but a really hot week. Josh Naylor has been great this year. And as a team, there's been more of a focus on driving the baseball and lifting the baseball this year. They went from being a bottom dweller team as far as home runs to in the top 10 right now. They're 11th in OPS. They're fifth in runs scored. It all comes down to a new approach, and they're always known for their pitching. Their bullpen has been arguably the best in baseball. Right now they're tied with the Yankees when it comes to bullpen ERA. I believe it was 2.49, uh, but they've racked up 18 more innings than the Yankees. They have a better whip, and they have more strikeouts. So you really could say the Guardians have the best bullpen in the game. And they have pretty good starting pitching as well. Game one, Tyler McGill versus Ben Lively. Lively, not a great pitcher throughout his career, a 478 ERA. But this year, sporting a 3.06 across six starts with the guards. He's really been a nice find for them um, at a time where they really needed starting pitching once Shane Bieber went down with the Tommy John. Now, McGill has made four rehab starts to get back to this point. He struck out 23 and 14 innings pitch, walked just one. I'm very curious if that mentality of attacking the strike zone carries over into MLB action again because it's better hitters. So you can get a little more fine. You can you know nitpick around the zone, and that can hurt you. We've seen way too many walks this year. I want to see McGill filling it up, and hopefully he's able to give them at some length in this start. Game two will be Adrian Hauser versus Carlos Carrasco. Hauser on a spot start. Nobody wants to see that. But, hey, at least he's lined up against Cookie, who has not pitched well this year, ERA over five. Although I will note in May he has a 3.0 ERA. He has pitched a lot better over his last three starts. Final game of the series, you got Jose Quintana versus Tristan McKenzie. Big edge to the Guardians in that matchup. Um, but we'll see. We'll see how everything breaks out for the Mets. I think if they can win game one here and build up, up some momentum, the Mets might just surprise us this week and really you know, start to make a push back towards contention. I will also note the reason Hauser's making a spot start is because you want to give Christian Scott another day and you are sort of setting up the six man rotation. If you want Christian Scott to be part of this rotation for a long while this year, a six man rotation is a great way to do that. Great, good way to protect him, to give him constant rest. So your weekend series is going to be exactly the same when it comes to the probable pitchers, Christian Scott, Luis Severino, Sean Manaya, 
And then David Peterson will be eligible to join the rotation after this weekend series on May 27th. So then the Mets can go to a six man with Peterson. They can go to a bullpen that includes both Peterson and Hauser and have them sort of both work as swingman. You never know who might get that spot start depending on who was used. The problem with that is if they have Reed Garrett, Adam Adovino, Edwin Diaz, Jorge Lopez, Drew Smith comes back off the aisle, which could happen this week, Sean Reed Foley and Jake Diekman, that's seven relievers. You don't have room for two guys in that bullpen as swingman. It's only one. So I, I point all that out just to say that if Adrian Hauser gets lit up against the Guardians in this spot start, there is a chance that's the last we see of him. There's a chance that the Mets would grab a, a relief pitcher to get through the rest of the week, and then David Peterson would either be a sixth starter in the rotation or would pitch out of the bullpen in a similar capacity to what Hazard's been doing, where they would have him make spot starts when the schedule does not allow for extra rest. So we'll see what happens there. Grant Hartwig or Josh Walker is going to be sent down, one of the two of them, for McGill. If Smith is ready, they both could be sent down on Monday. There's no left-handed starters in this series for the Guardians, so I'm very curious what Mark Vientos' playing time is going to be. That's one other story to monitor this week. Is he going to eat into Beatty's playing time at all when there's a righty on the mound? But we'll watch all of it. I still have the headline of the show for the final segment today, and that's Blade Tidwell is up in triple A huge promotion news when it comes to this farm system. So we will close out the show there in just a minute. First, though, a word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. Are you struggling to close deals? B2B selling is tougher than ever, and that's why I want to tell you about LinkedIn Sales Navigator. LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a sales intelligence platform that helps professionals effectively prospect and engage high-value customers, drive higher revenue, and increase sales performance. Sales Navigator helps you target the right buyers, surface key signals, and shows you hidden allies so you can find those buyers that are most likely to convert. Fueled by LinkedIn's 1 billion member platform, Sales Navigator gives you the most up-to-date first-party data, enabling you to unlock conversations with the people that matter. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a free 60-day trial at linkedin.com slash locked on. That is linkedin.com slash locked on for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to linkedin.com slash locked on and get started. All right, so let's switch up the hat. We got some big news on the prospect front. That is, Blade Tidwell is no longer a Binghamton Rumble Pony. He got the call up to Triple A. The Mets are very aggressive under David Stearns. That is a clear difference right now, whether it's Stearns, whether it's, uh, was it Chris Gross? Chris Gross? Kevin Gross? I believe it's Chris Gross. Uh, there's new scouting director that they got from the Astros. Uh, it is Chris. They're moving guys along quickly. Blade Tidwell was drafted in the second round back in 2022. Last year, he made eight starts in double A. This year, he pitches seven games in double A, five starts, two appearances where he piggybacked Max Cranick, who was rehabbing in Binghamton. And he's up. He's up already. And I am stunned that they're pushing him this quickly because I thought, you know, give him half the year, then maybe he gets the call to Syracuse. No, they're jumping right to it. They, they want to challenge him at the toughest level. They think he's ready for it. He's pitched to a 2.41 ERA this year with 44 strikeouts and 37 and a third innings pitch with a 1.07 whip. And that's the number you got to look at because last year we saw Tidwell thrive in high A. We saw Tidwell rack up a lot of strikeouts. What we did not see is him have success in double A, but it was a small sample. And we also saw elevated walk rates every stop he's had in his minor league career up to this season. Last year in high A in 17 starts, he had a 5.07 walk per nine. Then in double A and eight starts, he had a 4.446 walk per nine. This year, he has his walk per nine down to 2.65. That is a marked improvement. And he's only allowed one home run through those seven appearances and 37 and a third innings pitched. His last three starts have been very interesting. He had a absolute lights out gem where he threw eight scoreless innings with nine strikeouts, walked two, gave up five hits. Then he had a clunker, two innings, gave up 10 hits, allowed five runs. 
And then his last start was good again. Six innings pitch, four hits, one walk, six strikeouts, one earned run. This is pretty exciting that the Mets are pushing him along. Blade Tidwell very well could be the best pitching prospect in this system beyond Christian Scott, who's already up. And now you're going to see him pitch in the same rotation as Dom Hamill, Mike Vassell, and Jose Budo and Joey Lucchese, too. That's a damn good rotation in AAA. A lot of names to watch. And Tidwell is a guy that really could ascend beyond any of them. I don't know if we see him this year, but I never would have expected it prior to this promotion. Now anything is in the cards. He's a guy that if they needed a electric arm to stick in their bullpen at some point this year, you always could go that route before you convert him back to be a a starting pitcher. He's got great stuff. And the fact that he's limiting the walks, it's exciting. So we'll see what happens. I also love from the video that I've seen of him in the pictures, he's rocking what I would call a cross between a soul patch and a goatee. It's like his first facial hair at 22 years old. And I love it. I love it. I love it. I think that's why he's, he's had such great success. Got to grow out something on that chin. Uh, Ryland Thomas is also joining him, getting promoted up to AAA. Uh, Thomas is an outfielder, 24 years old. Uh, last year, across three levels, he hit over 320, started off in low A, ended up in double A. This year, 25 games in double A, he's hitting 323, 377 on base, 406 slug. Not a ton of power to his game, but hits for a high average, gets on base. He's an interesting prospect, and I- I'm really curious to see where he's going to play, uh, or not really where, how much he's going to play, and how the outfield is going to be aligned in Syracuse, because you have two guys who are. Four A players essentially, but guys the Mets could call on at any point this year. Trace Thompson and Ben Gamble. Gamble's been solid and consistent all season. Thompson has been scorching hot in May. He has eight home runs and five in his last three games, including a three home run performance. Luke Ritter had a three home run game as well. He's got a little bit of time in the outfield. He's also playing, um, you know, second base in the infield. Carlos Cortez has gotten some time in the outfield. I imagine his playing time is going to continue to suffer. I don't know if he'll play much. Mike Bruce Brasso, he's playing first base, but he's also gotten some time in the outfield. So we'll see if he's still playing out there at all. You have Acuna, who's been getting time in center. So there's a lot of mouths to feed in that outfield. That's not even mentioning the top prospect uh, in AAA, who's still hurt, and that's Drew Gilbert. The fact that they promoted Thomas, in some ways, makes me wonder how long is Gilbert going to be out? Because if you had Gilbert ready to go next week, well, Gilbert, Gamble, Thompson, you have a lot of guys. And so I don't know if the playing time would be there, but ultimately this is an opportunity for Thomas. They're, they're calling him up and we'll see what, what he does with that. I mean, he's because of the fact that the Mets farm system isn't really littered with outfielders. He's pretty comfortably, I'd say a top five outfield prospect in this system off the top of my head. Uh, depends on if you, you know, consider Jet Williams or Acuna an outfield prospect, but right now I don't. So you got Drew Gilbert, the clear one. You got Alex Ramirez, who's supposed to be the two, but you never really know. You got Nick Morabito, who have been talking about a lot, um, got the call up to high A and has been thriving there, just like he was in St. Lucie. I think he's definitely a more interesting prospect than Ryland Thomas, but you got to give Thomas credit. He is hit at some high levels now. And if you can, you know, back up a 320 average in double A and do it in triple A at a certain point, you got to take notice of a guy like that. So one of these, these prospects that isn't considered a top 30 guy because he doesn't have power. He's not some elite center fielder defensively that, that really wow scouts, but if he's helping you in games and, and he's showing that he could be a nice piece, you never know what it can be. So that was a really cool promotion to see. The other big one though, is Nolan the clean. So McLean is the two-way prospect that we've talked about a bunch this year, hitting and pitching in high A Brooklyn. Now he gets the call up to double A to join Brandon Sprout in that double A Binghamton rotation to take Tidwell's spot. So his last start was great. And he has really shown that he is probably better than that competition as a pitcher. He had nine strikeouts and four innings pitch, just one walk, one unearned run. Hasn't been challenged much across his last five starts. He gave up six, I believe, uh, in his second start of the season, six of the eight earned runs he's allowed this year. So since then, over his last five starts, a 0.82 ERA with 30 strikeouts and 22 innings. This is all about the pitcher getting called up. Now, yes, 
McLean had good numbers offensively in high A. He hit another home run today. Fifth home run, had seven doubles, 552 slug. Hits the ball a long way whenever he connects. The problem is 38 strikeouts and 67 at-bats. This was bad news for Nolan McLean, the hitter, because in double A, I think he's just going to get exposed, and I don't know how much longer he's going to be a hitter because his real future with the Mets is as a pitcher. But I'm excited to see him keep trying it, and hopefully he, he does prove people wrong. I, I would love nothing more than to admit that McLean can do it at the big league level and, and hit and pitch. I just look at the strikeout numbers, and I think, man, he gets up to some better pitching in double A, some older arms who are more experienced. I think he's going to be barbecue chicken for them, and he's going to be striking out even more and might not connect the same way he did in high A. But again, you never know. Uh, another promotion, Omar De Los Santos got called up. Uh, he's basically just filling the, the spot left by Thomas in double A. Uh, hasn't hit well really throughout his career, but particularly this season, 165 average. So I, I wouldn't note that one as much. You know, this is more about. Tidwell to AAA, McLean to AA, and also Thomas to AAA. Uh, now, looking at the pitching in this organization, I already mentioned Vassal, Hamill, Tidwell, all in AAA, and Budo as well as another guy that you know, former top prospect who has now shown himself to be a pretty nice starting pitcher who can potentially help the Mets for years to come. Double A, you got Tyler Stewart, Joander Suarez, who are holdovers from last year now getting their first full season in double A and guys that I would think stay there all year, but we'll see. Um, and then you have Brandon Sprout and Nolan McLean. Actually, I want to, I want to amend something I just said. Suarez, he might get a, a push along. I wonder if he's ever going to get moved to the bullpen. So uh, a little asterisk on that one, but Sprout and McLean are now the headliners in double A. They started the year in high A and here they are quickly before we even get to June in double. And this is, uh, a couple guys that were just drafted. So it's really exciting to see the pitching really rising to the surface. The Mets have a lot of options in the future. And some of those guys can be really good trade bait. Not that the Mets are going to be buying at this deadline, but just as you continue on to a competitive window that you hope starts this year, but you expect to start next year, when you get to this depth of prospects, it allows you to have the flexibility to add in multiple avenues. So really, really exciting developments that continue to come from the Mets farm system. Anyway, that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked on Mets. I appreciate all of you who tuned in. You don't want to miss tomorrow's show. And you're listening on the audio side, make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. We're trying to make a push to 9,000 subs. So I appreciate all of you who continue to subscribe. If you want to be a Locked on Mets insider, find the link in the episode description or go to subtext.com slash Locked on Mets. You can find me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first watch every day. Now, for your second watch, head over to YouTube to the first ever 24 7 streaming channel that covers everything in the world of sports, including the NBA and the NHL playoffs right now. That is Locked On Sports Today. Check it out, streaming 24 7 on YouTube and on Amazon Fire TV channels.